Okay, hello traders, and welcome to this live intraday strategy webinar on Daily FX. Today is Monday, June 13th, and I'm Michael Boutros. Good to be with you guys this morning. Uh, Michael, good day from Sydney. Great to see you here in the room. Mark, we got all the SB crowd in here today. Great to see you guys. Uh, Frank, uh, guys, before we get started, if I could just get some confirmation that the audio and video feeds are working properly, uh, we will jump right in. Lionel, uh, Cable, in light of Brexit and the U.S. shooting, we'll definitely take a look at Cable. Brian, I see some comments here with regards to, um, you know, the events that the horrible uh, tragedy that we saw in Orlando over the weekend, how that'll affect the markets. We'll go over that in a moment. Uh, Michael, loud and clear. Pooja, thanks for that. All right, good to go. Brian, thank you, sir. Guest, thank you. All right, so I guess I'll, I'll apply, I'll, you know, address that really quickly guys as far as the events in in Orlando obviously it's the humanitarian effect is devastating the impact it's gonna have on markets should be rather limited um, when you look at events like this it's really what does the event entail for future policy either from the fiscal side or the monetary side uh, I don't think you're gonna see any gun laws change ahead of the election um, and therefore the limited the impact on markets is likely to be limited especially on a week like this week where we get um, the Fed so I do want to move into the Fed before we get started into the details here on what expectations we do have uh, but again as far as the tragedy in Orlando guys you know I wouldn't necessarily call that a tradable event uh, or something that's gonna spark necessarily uh, a trend that we can work with so uh, again we you know our hearts reach out to everyone in the area um, absolutely devastating. Obviously, the worst uh, terrorist attack here in the United States since 9/11. So, um, our prayer go our prayers go out to them. That being said, uh, the FOMC's on tap. Welcome to non um, FOMC. Excuse me. Week. We've been highly waiting. We've been highly anticipating this release. Uh, looking at the dollar index, let's take a quick look at the dollar index. We'll definitely jump into the Brexit calls and all that, guys, in just a moment. Uh, but here's what the dollar index looks like, and we'll look at the 30-minute, and we'll also take a look, guys, at some of the trades that we've been following over on SB Trade Desk. Uh, obviously, this is going to be a critical week. All the dollar pairs are in play, and certainly we do have opportunities on those. We'll be focused mostly on the dollar crosses. Um, as we get into that Wednesday release. So looking at the Fed futures funds rate, which is market, uh, what the market is basically pricing in uh, as far as the FOMC. <laughs> We've got a great crowd here today. Adam, great to see you. Norm, uh, great to see everyone here in the room. Uh, Evanly, great to see you. Um, so what I want to say is this, the non farm the, uh, excuse me, uh, Fed Fund Futures is pricing in a 2% probability of a cut, which is nothing, 0% probability of a hike. If we look at the interest rate expectation spectrum going out into 2017, right now, as it stands, Fed Fund Futures are not the first material expectation, meaning above 50% probability of a hike doesn't come till February at this point, and that's only at 51%. Okay, so what does that mean? There is a discrepancy between what the Fed is relaying to markets uh, with expectations that we will see further hikes this year. Markets are pricing out that expectation. Okay, like I said, the first material expectation of 51.1% lands in February. So the room or the risk is for that expectation to be brought forward at this point, not pushed back. Meaning, if the Fed comes out and is a little bit more hawkish, if they start to pad expectations that they were kicking out those interest rate hikes, you're likely to see the dollar remain supported. Now, it depends where the dollar is trading as we head into the release. Obviously, Fed fund futures can really shift, and you can see that be a very variable uh, reading as you head into the release. Uh, we'll keep you updated on SB as far as different uh you know shifts in that gauge but as it stands right now the markets aren't expecting any interest rate hikes this year so if they do start to bring in those expectations look for the dollar to find some support now it doesn't mean that we're full-on bullish the dollar just yet and we'll go over those uh, levels in a moment but certainly those are the expectations also keep in mind one very important thing guys um, and the fact is that 
This is not your run-of-the-mill interest rate decision. We're going to be getting the quarterly projections as they pertain to growth, unemployment, inflation, and interest rates. And certainly the dot plot has been certainly the, the major, major market mover as we get these projections. Where the Fed committee members see interest rates and what's the appropriate time of timing moving forward. Uh, I wrote a little piece on daily effects. If you guys uh, are subscribed there or if you're on my distribution list, you would have gotten this over the weekend. But if you go to the uh, market forecasts, I do write the gold forecast every week. Um, for daily effects, you can see that the median Fed funds rate, okay, heading into 2016 is somewhere in the range of 0.75 to 1%. That's what market expectations uh, were at the last quarterly projection. So heading into the end of 2016, you're looking for 0.75 to 1% for the median rate, okay? We're currently right now at 0 0.5. So if we move out, or 0 0.25, excuse me, if we move out to um, the longer term terminal rate, which is sort of the normal rate, expectations are at 3.25. And that's the median estimate, okay? So if we see this start to move higher or lower, those are the expectations that we'll be watching to gauge what we should be looking for for the greenback. All right? Um, so any questions on the Fed? Feel free to throw them out throughout the, the session, but that's sort of the game plan moving forward. Looking at the dollar index, the daily chart is extremely dirty or ugly, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm really more focused on the 30 minute, which I'll show you in just a moment. But the levels of which we came off with, pretty pretty clean on that end. The structural decline, you saw a break above the upper median line parallel. We broke right back below it early this month. We're back above it, treating it as support here today. Um, more importantly, you're looking at a 618 clean retracement that we made back last week with a clean rebound off that, giving way to this rally that we're seeing. Okay, Broadly speaking, you're still looking at this within the confines of a broader downtrend. This is just simply a sliding parallel of the same slope and you can see that govern the highs that we made off last month. So the 30 minute chart, and this is what we've been following uh, over on SB Trade Desk looks like this, okay? And here's what the 30 minute chart looked like last week. This was back on the 9th. And we had gotten a, a top side break of that near term channel. The near term bearish invalidation level was 11,839 to 11,845. Once that broke, you're looking higher. Initial targets 887 and 902. We just missed that 902 level. Oh no, we got it. I'm sorry, this is the 50. Um, so this is the 618. We just turned ahead of that on Friday. Basic trend line resistance off the highs, capping that advance. Okay, so we'll be looking for the opening range for the week to give us some play. Keep in mind, guys, heading into a release like this, you're likely to see a lot of chop on the dollar crosses as we get into Wednesday's release. Um, this is, again, although we're not expecting any change to the main refi rate, certainly this is going to be um, the major event risk for the dollar crosses heading into this week, for sure. Uh, and it's basically based mostly on the quarterly projections that we're going to get. So um, I'm kind of going to take a little bit more of a neutral stance here on the dollar index. We do have some stronger biases on the dollar pairs, but as it stands right now, you're still at risk uh, for a pullback in the dollar as we stand from these levels. So I'd be cautious on any type of uh, long exposure until we get through 11,927. Uh, you had that swing low back from the 26th. It's basically where we capped out the advance last week and near term, you're at risk here uh, for long exposure on the index. So not as clear as we would like to see it as far as the Dow Jones FXCM dollar index. Remember at its inception, equally weighted Euro, Aussie, Sterling, Yen. So the much, you know, the, the most widely traded, most liquid currencies versus the dollar. Um, and certainly we'll be looking for this to take cues on some of our dollar crosses. All right, so you're sort of in no man's land here. You're right slap in the middle of the monthly range. Let's see if we can't pan out to a decent uh, opening range for the week. Hey, Lloyd, great to see you here in the room. Uh, Chris, good morning. Could you look at Dollar Cat? Absolutely. Let's take a look at Dollar Cat, specifically on the back of Friday's uh, employment report. Here's what the Dollar Cat looked like last week. We put out a. Uh, a scalp right ahead of that release, guys. This was on daily FX. Uh, this is what we were looking at right ahead of the release. This was Thursday uh, afternoon. We noted that look, there's a top side 
risk here for a pop higher. Excuse me, major resistance near term, you're looking at 2831, and that's basically what we're trading below right now. Here's what dollar CAD looks like. First on the daily chart, and then we'll jump into the 30 minute. So what I wanted to highlight here is you got two different things in view here. You have the actual stretch lows from October, and that comes in at uh, 128.31. That level coincides, hey Dom, great to see you, no worries. That level coincides with the upper median line parallel for the current operative slope and another parallel here. And this is basically if you take trend line resistance, just off the highs from last month and this month, take a parallel of that to that swing low, we almost rebounded right off that. Take a parallel of that from that swing low that we made last month, specifically on the 26th, that converges right in that region heading into the next few days. So near-term resistance 128.31 is sort of the level I'm looking at for dollar CAD. Here's what it looks like on the 30-minute chart, and here's what it looks like, again, in comparison to what we had last week. So we've made it through um, that first target at 27.56. Here's 28.30. Again, that converges right here now as we move this forward in time. Um, and heading into obviously the FOMC, but more importantly, just the start of the week, I am looking for a little bit of a pop higher here uh, to possibly offer some fresh short exposure into that upper median line parallel. Depends what it looks like. The immediate upside bias remains intact uh, from Friday's release. Obviously, Friday's release saw a test of the weekly uh, low. We got a rejection break right above the median line. So here's a sliding parallel, the same slope, and again, we've been riding that since the start of Sunday trade last night. So I do think you possibly get one stretch higher back into this region. We'd start to look for short exposure here. As long as we're in the confines of this descending formation, we don't want to get too aggressive on the long side yet, although the immediate bias is still higher. Um, also note that the momentum signature here still seems pretty constructive. Uh, you know, you saw multiple breaks above 60 for the first time in a few days last week, opening the week here above 60 as well. We'll look to see that 40 support and see if we can't get that stretch higher in dollar CAD. As far as CAD data is concerned, you're pretty light in the first part of the week. Heading into the latter part of the week, you do get CPI uh, for the month of May. Uh, that is expected to see a nice uptick on the month on month. Year on year, expected to soften a bit. So that comes out on the 17th. So heading into Friday, uh, post FOMC, you do get those CPI figures out of Canada and should offer some volatility on these CAD crosses. Uh, over on SB Trade Desk, we have been tracking Euro CAD, uh, even some uh, interesting levels on Aussie CAD. So definitely heading to the end of the week, we'll shift our focus more towards those CAD setups uh, once we get that FOMC out of the way. Hey, hey, hello everyone from Egypt, says a guest. Lloyd, we'll definitely take a look at Euro dollar for sure. Any questions on dollar CAD before we move off? Uh, Chris, hope that helps uh, for dollar CAD. And again, we'll be giving an update over on SB Trade Desk as far as all the dollar updates are concerned right ahead of the release. Uh, by the way, I do see a question here. Uh, if you're interested in subscription to SB, we are still running that ad. Or, or that um, promotion. So uh, here's the link. This is a service run by myself and chief technical strategist from Daily FX, uh, Jamie Setley, um, offering trade setups on a uh, near term and longer term basis, as well as daily webinars for the same style of trading. Do you still see the long term bullish, Chris? Hey, you're more than welcome. I think you're talking about dollar cat still, right? So here's the thing, uh, Chris. Obviously, for the purposes of this webinar, I'm much more near-term trader, right? Uh, I don't really put on positions for months on months on end. This is what I would point out to you. I think this is like the coolest thing, Chris. Uh, we've been following this slope over on SB for months now. A couple of things I just want to note. A, you know, the break, um, well, let me highlight this first, 129.76, okay? If you guys remember, early in the month for May, this outside day key reversal came off of a critical support level, Chris. Absolutely paramount. 2511 uh, into 2537. We were tracking that for months on this decline. Wasn't expecting a rebound quite this sharp, but hey, support is support. Look what was there. 
You had a former trend line resistance that dates all the way back to 2002. Okay. Then you had basic parallel resistance from that trend line support, support, and you saw another rebound here last month. Okay. So for me, Chris, this is what we would need to break below to invalidate the broader uptrend. So near term, yeah, I do think that you could see a spike into 2830. You can see this thing turn around to the downside. I do want to highlight this key confluence region right here at this point. This is from last week. At this point, we're going to highlight this region, 2630. You have the median line. You have basic channel support. We zoom this out a little bit. Basic channel support, right? And a 764 retracement, all converging here, heading into the 15th. Just a few days back into the, this is Fed day here. So this, for me, is going to be sort of the big, big level uh, near term. But on the broader term, this is going to be the bullish invalidation level. One other level I want to highlight, what would put me back on the constructive course, Chris, for the longer term, is this purple line you see here. It's really faint. You might not see it at home, uh, but let me highlight it. This line right here. This, my friends, is a simple slope off this basic trend line support. Same slope here that caught the highs, extending off the low from 2006, pivot, 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 resistance, look where that level coincides right now, right into 2676. So for me, in order to validate the broader trend here, Chris, I'd need to see either a break above 130 or a break below 25, uh, basically the 25 handle, let's just call it. This for me is the key range that we need to clear near term for the dollar CAD to really validate whether the broader bias will stay constructive or not. Okay, but certainly the initial response we got off that longer term trend line is encouraging. Okay, as far as the near term outlook is concerned, 2830 is going to be key resistance near term. On the support side, like I said, look for that 2630 level uh, to be the first level of which, if you do give out, look to see that drop into that key support barrier down into 25, 25, 11. Chris, does that make sense? We've been all over this one. A lot of this is going to be based and determined by whether or not we get a Fed that is more hawkish or a Fed that is more dovish. Remember, we haven't really seen much from the BOC. Um, obviously, the data that we got as far as the employment numbers on Friday were really good. But we'll see uh, if that participation rate is a concern. Remember that the participation rate did drop. Although you got a much bigger than expected expansion in jobs, and although you got a much bigger than expected drop in the headline unemployment rate, you did see a contraction in labor force participation. Never a good thing. Okay, And as we always know, that will tend to put artificial downward pressure on the headline unemployment rate. So... I didn't really interpret those numbers as super constructive there for uh, for dollar ca for the uh, CAD in general, but certainly the data from Canada hasn't been all that bad. Hasn't been all that bad. Hey, Chris, you're more than welcome, man. Great to see you in the room. Okay, so that is dollar CAD. Spent a little bit more time on that, but I hope uh, you got some clarity on that. Moving forward, I do want to look at the Kiwi dollar. This is another one that we highlighted over on Daily FX uh, ahead of the RBNZ. Uh, or this is post the RBNZ breakout. So first I want to go over the daily chart and just want to highlight this critical region. You know, we talked about the initial resistance region that this thing was heading into. Post the release, the first initial target was 7108. That's the 2011 low. Then you had this critical region at 7150, which not only represented a basic key 618 retracement of the entire decline, but also basic channel resistance. And this is just a parallel of channel support. Here's what the Kiwi dollar looks like now on the daily. We capped the high and literally caught that high, whoop, right off the bat. Okay, so that ended up being a high stretch right into that region before we pulled off. And the key region heading deeper into the month is still going to be the 70 handle into that 7150 zone. Uh, for me, the Kiwi is not really a play right now until we get into the RBNZ, just because, again, we're sitting literally mid-range uh, of the broader key invalidation levels that I'm looking at for the pair. 
So you're at risk for a little bit more of a pullback sub 71.52, which is again that key 6.8. As you get deeper into the week, that's just going to converge more and more so on that channel resistance. So that's really your level to beat and the major resistance near term for Kiwi dollar. Key support, I extend it into 69.70 into the 70 handle. Uh, you know, we've been following this chart again for months, but here's the deal. You got a probe breakthrough March. You got a probe and a breakthrough here in May. Both of them closed above, but it was also the origin of that breakout post RBNZ. So I do want to keep my eye on that 30 pip region here. Also, if you extend out further, a basic trend line resistance extending off the October highs from last year. I'm sorry, this is 2014. Uh, that basic trend line resistance also converges on that 30 pip range heading deeper into the week. Okay, so the key daily levels are pretty clear as far as uh, Kiwi is concerned. Here's what the scalp looked like last week. And here's what the scalp looks like right now. Oops. Okay. So, um, 71.50, the major resistance that we just talked about, even on a near-term approach, aside from just that 618 on the daily chart, the slope of the advance, if you take a sliding parallel of that same slope and extend it off some of these highs that we made in March, or excuse me, this is May, you can see that also turning just ahead of that confluence resistance zone that we're looking for. So here's the open of the week. You're above the median line. This median line right here is defined by this median line that you're looking at, guys. Okay, we're back within the confines of this initial upside pitchfork. And, oops. And the focus remains higher in Kiwi dollar. Or let me take it back. The bullish invalidation is 69.70. And that matches here very nicely with the lower median line parallel. A basic 38.2 comes in at 69.66, just lower. And of course, on the daily chart, we already highlighted that 69.69 level as that 50% retrace and confluence of some median lines here. So the levels are pretty clear. Uh, the levels are pretty clear here on Kiwi. I'm looking for some pullback. I'm looking for some more dollar definitive action here to get involved. Um, but I do think you possibly see a stretch lower here before it makes a final stretch into a high. Um, again, I'm not looking to target anything on the long side, even if we do get some triggers, guys. Um, ahead of 71.50. That's really the major, major level. For a guest who's asking a very general question here, I'm going to need some more background information. Dear sir, please, I want to know what's the best strategy for new scalping. So, um, guess there is a lot of different ways to attack the markets. Um, there's a lot of different strategies that you can use on a near-term basis. Uh, my strategy is one of which we focus on the levels. We have a near-term momentum oscillator that just helps us define what the near-term momentum profile looks like. And we got a broader invalidation um, trade. So basically, we're constructive above a certain level. We're looking to buy dips above that or we're bearish below a certain level. We're looking to sell rallies below that. Um, and we look to attack about 25% of what the daily ATR is. So if you're putting in 100 pips on a, on a pair on a daily basis, um, you know, that'll give you a, a profit target of about 25 pips per scalp. So remember, uh, the biggest, uh, most important thing I need to just stress for you guests who's just getting started in, in near-term trading or scalping is your risk management, okay? A lot of people will look to say, hey, I'm only looking for 20 pips. Hey, I'm only looking for 15 pips. And all of a sudden, risk management goes right out the window, right? We still have to maintain a minimum of one-to-one. -one. I mean, that's like if you're aggressive like I am. Uh, otherwise, we'll still want to see if we can get a two-to-one where we can stretch it um, to maintain that risk-to-reward ratio. But there are guys who use purely momentum. Uh, I know if you watch James Stanley's finger trap uh, strategy, it's, it's you know a purely momentum-based uh, scalping strategy. There's guys who will be looking at one-minute charts, right? It really depends on what your time horizon is, but you're in the right place. So if you have specific questions, guests, do feel free to let them out or do feel free to post them on the message board. If you have a minute, can you also take a look at oil, Chris says. Dollar CAD follows it closely. Thanks. Absolutely. And you know what? It's a good, uh, it's a good segue right here. Uh, so for the oil trade, you may have seen this posted uh, on uh, MB Forex on my Twitter handle. For those of you on SB, you've been watching this trade for uh, months and months and months. Guess what? 
we were very close uh, <laughs> to calling the high on this. 5106 is the level of which I was calling as major critical resistance. There was a lot up there, guys. First of all, it is a basic 100% or two equal legs up off the low. It's 5106. You have the upper median line parallel for the current operative structure we've been following from the highs that you made in February and May of last year. Okay. And also, you had that stretch high from October, and all of those coincided right in this region. You closed, you probed right through a reversal day, an outside reversal day off of resistance, sort of one of your key reversals, and one of those reversals that tend to put a bearish bias on the pair, was accompanied by a trigger break in momentum. So for the, for the uh, guest who was asking earlier, um, you know, what do we use the momentum signature for? What do we use RSI for? This is a perfect example. We just use this for a graphical representation, a confirmation of a shift in momentum. Okay, Just as you draw trend line resistance in price, uh, trend line support and resistance in price, you can do the same in momentum. And while this is not anything as a standalone strategy, it is certainly confirmation. It helps us give us conviction on our on our near-term biases, okay? Uh, there's nothing magical about any oscillator, guys. Anytime I talk about an oscillator, I always preface it by saying they're all backwards looking. There is not one oscillator that is forward looking, okay? They tell you what happened, not what's going to happen. That being said, when you see something materializing in price and you get those trigger breaks in momentum, again, a lot of times it'll give you that confirmation, that conviction to put a little bit more. Sometimes it'll attack those a little bit more aggressively. That being said, near term, you're at support right now for crude, okay, right now. Is that a call for to go long? Absolutely not. Uh, you might see a pause here. You could see a bit of a rebound, but all I do want to note is this. The break below 47.70 is what I would need to validate a break lower and a reversal in crude. Why? That is a basic opening range for the month. Here's your monthly open. The monthly low comes in at 47.73. You stretched into key resistance. An outside day reversal put us bearish. Now you're looking to test the monthly opening range low. So again, your basic opening range strategies. You look for the market to set a high or low first week, week and a half uh, of the month. You look for that range to break. And that trend will typically extend towards the latter part of that month. Um, we saw it last month. Uh, here was the break that we got on the 12th after setting the opening range, a very well-defined opening range below the April high day close. You saw that close above on the 12th, gave you an upside bias, push into a late month high. Similarly, the previous month, you got a really early week opening, uh, monthly opening range there. You got the opening range break on the 8th. You came back and tested it as support. It held. You closed the month right at the highs. Okay, it's not a strategy or um, you know a factor that'll that'll always work 100% of the time. Nothing in trading does, uh, but certainly can be a very strong tell on what your medium-term directional bias is. And as it stands right now, I'm looking for that break below 47.70 to mark a much more steeper, a much more significant pullback here in crude. Key resistance is still going to be 51. Okay, 51.06. Um, Chris, any questions further on crude? A trade we've been following very closely. Checking structural support right now. This is a sliding parallel for the same operative slope we've been following for the last, I don't know, five months, basically since the start of the year uh, from that February low. We've been holding within the confines of this formation. A sliding parallel of that same slope caught the, uh, the drop off that you got there on the 18th. We're now testing that as support. It breaks up 47.70 really opens up a larger decline here in crude. So from a trading standpoint, guys, heading into the weekly open, you know, you could see some strength here, but sub 51, you'd be looking for a trigger on the short side. By the way, the invalidation level, if we do clear 51 on the upside, next upside target isn't until basically 54, 53.90 would be your first initial topside target on a stretch higher here beyond 51 in crude.
Any other question? Uh, Chris says no. Thank you. You're more than welcome, Chris. More than welcome, sir. I'll see you tomorrow morning in SB. Um, uh, Chris saying so. Bearish oil means bullish dollar CAD. So. I would be cautious to really work too aggressively with that type of um, correlation, corollary um, biases, Chris, heading into the FOMC. But yes, if we do see uh, crude breakdown, that means CAD weakness. That would tend to put a little bit more upside slope here in dollar CAD, which is why it kind of makes sense with what we're seeing in the loonie right now, right? We just went over this earlier. Uh, you can see a scenario where dollar CAD uh, stretches into a new high. Oh, here we are already on the way uh, towards that 2830 level we talked about earlier. Maybe even the upper median line parallel uh, would give crude certainly an opportunity to check those lows and see if we can get a downside break of that monthly opening range. All right. So that is dollar CAD and crude. Great questions. Um, we went over Kiwi as well. Um, British Pound, I do see a lot of questions here with regards to the Brexit, so let me go through these one by one. Um, yeah, you're more than welcome, Chris. Uh, guest from the UK, great to see you. Okay, Cable, that was Lionel asking about Cable in light of the Brexit uh, and the U.S. shooting. Again, we're not going to get into the U.S. shooting and that's impact, but certainly Cable uh, heading into the Brexit vote on the 23rd. There's some questions on the Euro too, so we'll go over both of those for Jamie and Lionel. Here's what the uh, British pound looks like first on the daily chart, um, and then we'll go into the 30-minute. So look. Heading into the Brexit vote, obviously you're going to get these polls that are going to come out on the daily. They're going to shake things up. You're likely to see a lot of back, back and forth action here in, in Sterling, guys. It's known as a professionally traded market. It's known as a trade that gives you uh, the throw over, a break of resistance and a close below, uh, a false break of support and a close above. Uh, you know, this pair is known for this kind of price action and certainly. Um, heading into the Brexit vote, it's probably only going to be exacerbated. Now, that being said, I see a question here that's very concerning. Who was that? Jamie, what are your thoughts on Euro dollar, both long or short, before the Brexit vote uh, or before the Brexit? Jamie, are you talking about taking a hedge on long and short Euro dollar, Jamie, or are you talking about which one do I prefer? Because I'm definitely, definitely never going to advocate going long and short any pair. I think the concept of hedging among retail traders is just so misunderstood. From sitting on the desk all those years, guys, I can tell you um, with almost like 90% certainty. Don't quote me, but um, usually a retail trader who's trying to hedge is going to end up taking a loss on both of them, if not a net loss on the, on the hedge. Um, that being said, the impact of a Brexit is likely to be more... Uh, dragging on the euro initial con initial um, initial uh, reaction for the sterling may in fact be quite weak but the broader longer term implications in my humble opinion are going to be on the side of the euro because of the precedence that it sets um, and both the implications of what a brexit would mean for the euro project as a whole so um, looking at the british pound I'm not surprised at all if this thing gives us a rally right back into near-term resistance. Uh, the major bearish invalidation for the near term immediately would be 43. Okay, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see a rally back towards 44, uh, both the May low day close as well as um, the basic, I guess, pretty close to the weekly opening, uh, the monthly opening range lows. Uh, this that we made, this break that we made here on Friday, for me, is a break. So certainly near term, the risk is still lower, sub 44. It's just that you've stretched pretty, you know, pretty far out at this point. I'm not going to be looking to, to sell a rally towards a fresh two-month low. So momentum is at 40. You have a soft target here that we've been watching at 41.20. Um, and at this point, again, I want to take a little bit more of a... Uh, sort of neutral stance. I'd be looking to sell a rally back towards 43 if we get it. Uh, by the way, 41.21 or 41.20 is the low day close for April. It's highlighted right here by the move that we made on April 6th and should offer some near-term support here in the British pound. Here's what it looks like on the 30-minute chart. 
Oops. <clears throat> and here's what we look like last week for the British pound on SB trade desk. Here's the here's the trade that we were following. Oops. There it is. Okay, so we're still within the confines of that same formation. That's this right here. Uh, you broke below the median line. You broke below this support barrier, which was 43. And that's now the near-term resistance level right here. So as long as we stay below 43, I do think you sell a rally. If this pops right back up, your ideal entry in time and price would sort of be right at the 43 handle. Heading into um, just, I guess this is a day after the FOMC. Uh, that would be sort of your ideal sell scenario. Uh, as far as support on a break lower beyond the low day close that we made here for April, you're looking at confluence support here at the 140.60 level. 764 retracement of the advance and the 50 line for the current downslope that we've been working with. Okay, so that takes you into this region in time. That's right ahead of FOMC. So again, Sterling, the broader picture still looks lower. Do I have a scalp setup or a play necessarily from here? Not necessarily. And guys, remember, specifically with near-term trading, it's not just about knowing the directional bias. It's not just being right on whether the market's going to move higher or lower. There's got to be a setup. Okay, There's got to be an area of which, okay, here's the level of which I'm wrong. If the market moves against me, I want to be out of this position. Um, and with the same respect, we have to respect that risk to reward ratio in every position that we take. Steve from Long Island says, Sterling dollar traders are already um, naively short sterling and heavily long dollar. Uh, something for the bears to think about. Absolutely. And this is something you're going to want to track on SSI for sure. Um, everyone's expecting that the pound is going to is going to is going to, you know, fall off the side of a planet. If we do see the Brexit vote, markets have been you know, taking this into consideration for months. And certainly over the last couple of weeks, we've gotten a couple of poll, uh, polls, excuse me, that have suggested that we are leaning towards um, uh, a leave vote. So I completely agree with you, Steve. This might be a pretty crowded trade as it stands right now. Um, that being said, from a technical standpoint, yeah, you're still bearish sub 43. Um, would love to see a little bit more of a concerted rebound off of uh, 40, 60, if we get down there, bearish invalidation uh, would need to be a break above that 43 handle, specifically 43.50 for the pound. Any questions on sterling? Michael, how do we measure how much has already been priced in? in as to the sterling uh, being weaker at this stage. Uh, Michael, one way to do that is to check out Daily FX's SSI, Speculative Sentiment Index, which tells you how our retail traders uh, are positioned. Now, while SSI is not going to be a broader market um, gauge, guys, it is a really strong gauge of what the retail market's doing. Uh, FXCM has one of the largest spaces as far as um, you know sheer numbers of traders that we're looking at and certainly can be a very nice help to see what market participants are doing. Uh, but Mike, you don't even need necessarily a gauge like Fed Fund Futures or anything like that as far as interest rates because you could just look at it in the headlines, Mike. You know, I'm not a fundamental trader by any means, but I'm always cognizant about what's coming out in the headlines, what they're being reported on, on the financial publications, what Reuters and CNBC and Bloomberg. You know, when these headlines are coming out, this is telling you that the market's already paying attention to this. And we already got a couple of votes that said leave. And certainly the market has reacted in kind um, as it stands right now. Again, um, I think there's a, just a lot of interest on the short side for the pound. So I'd be cautious. Like I said, from a technical standpoint, still looks lower. Um, another question here from Spencer. It says, Sterling Yen and Sterling Kiwi show much stronger, clear trends lately. Uh, thoughts on playing these pairs in the short term heading into the Brexit. Uh, would this also avoid uncertainty in the U.S. dollar pairs around FOMC? Spencer, great mindset. I love where you're at. And this is something that we've been covering 
uh, over on SB as well. Some of the Sterling crosses, guys, do look pretty poised. Uh, I do want to highlight that I have Sterling Yen near term at median line res uh, support. This is a median line structure we've been following since September of last year. You've got some really nice pivots, really nice touches of some of the slope lines here. Checking today, not only the median line from the decline off the highs, but also an extending parallel for the broader structure we were following. Extending off that May low, you can see that the caught the low right here in April, and right now converges on the low. So yeah, I do think that actually you can see a lot more play, Spencer, not only in Sterling um, Yen, but also Sterling Key. Here's what Sterling Key looks like. And the Sterling Key play, uh, just for your information, and again, not a recommendation from Daily FX or FXCM, uh, but certainly something we'll be looking at on SB and something I'm personally looking at. Sterling Key on a scenario where you do see the pound bottom out, meaning um, the release comes out, you get pound jackknifing into a new low. I would love to fade that move, okay? And a pair I would like to fade it against, in my humble opinion, would be Sterling Key. And specifically, if Kiwi Dollar holds resistance. So if Kiwi holds sub 7150, and you see pound spike into a new low, I think Kiwi, uh, Sterling Kiwi is a beautiful play. Is a beautiful play. So uh, Spencer, both of those are pairs I'd be looking at. Uh, specifically for me, I would be a little bit leaning more so, mo more towards <laughs> sterling key uh, just because of the relative uh, performance of each of them versus the dollar uh, but definitely um, well let me take one step back Spencer heading into the Brexit the Fed volatility should more or less have uh, panned its way through the market okay so I wouldn't necessarily say you want to avoid dollar pairs heading into the Brexit heading into the FOMC heading into this Wednesday sure uh, once we get FOMC out of the way, I think pounds dollar will start to look a little bit clear. Uh, but that being said, certainly the other uh, pound Kiwi trade does look very, very interesting. Dom, so he says, please, can you give some more information on the monthly opening range, immediate month or previous two months? So, uh, Dom, the monthly opening range takes place each month. Uh, and we use it as just, an, again, a way of gauging near-term directional bias. It doesn't really work across all the pairs. You'll see that some pairs will be much stronger performances uh, with the opening range. Some won't really work well. I can tell you out of experience that the yen crosses typically don't give us the best opening ranges. Um, but if we're looking at a, at a pair like the British Pound, I think is what we were using earlier as an example, or uh, Dollar Cat or something like that, you're looking for the first... It's not a defined, let me take one step back, Dom. I don't want you to say, okay, it's the first two weeks. On the 14th, I'll look for the break. It doesn't work like that. You want to stress price action more so than time. So, Dom, if the market makes a high, tests a low, and tests a high within the first week, that's the opening range for the month. If that high, low, high stretch or test of a low, high, low doesn't come until the 14th or the 15th, then that's the opening range. But you're basically looking for the market to test a high, low, high early in the month or a low, high, low early in the month to give us that break looking for a late month move. So for example, here is an opening range for February, uh, for November in Aussie. You made a high, you made a low within the first six days of trade. That opening range didn't break until the 20th and you close that at the highs. So... Um, you're looking for that opening range within the first week, week and a half, two weeks of trade. Now, Dom, you use the same strategy on a weekly opening range basis. So you look for a Sunday, Monday stretch or a Sunday to Tuesday stretch where you set a low, high, low, high, low, high, and you look for a break of that to stretch into the weekly extreme. Dom, this is based on the fact, and this is research can tell you, it's not just Michael Boutros. It's, we've done studies where markets will tend to set their extremes um, or will, send, will, will tend to set their weekly highs and lows at the extremes. Meaning, if a market's in an uptrend, typically, more likely than not, you'll set the low early in the week and the high late in the week. If the market is in a downtrend, more likely than not, you'll set the high early in the week and the low towards the later, latter part of the week. So the highs and lows tend to come on the extremes of price action or, or of time. Okay, both on a weekly basis and a monthly basis. So that's sort of where the idea of opening ranges comes from, Dom. Uh, we talk a lot about those um, in these webinars. So definitely, uh, Dom, if you have any more questions on that, feel free. 
Um, we are running low on time, so I do need to run through some of these setups real quick. Aussie dollar, guys, I just want to highlight this is our near-term support. Look at 7360, uh, which is the high day close for October. Definitely a pivot we've been watching. You got a lot of trend lines there, okay? A lot of trend lines there. You have the median line off the highs. Um, again, you have a former upper median line parallel, which is also converging there, and the 50 line of the ascending formation all right here into 7360. So I'm looking for near-term support there in the Aussie. Uh, we'll see if that holds or not. If you do see a downside break, again, you have structural support just lower, but that would suggest you have a much larger reversal in Aussie dollar. Again, not my base case scenario. My base case scenario, look for a move into that lower median line parallel for possible long exposure off of this region. Uh, 74 being the level that we need to get through on the upside to really validate continuation uh, for the trend we've been following off of last month's low. Okay. Um, hey, Michael, you're more than welcome on that. I appreciate it. Uh, a guest saying, hi, Mike, I agree. Uh, Brexit vote would hit the euro expectations as well as fears of investors exit from the UK would probably also trigger resignation of the Prime Minister Cameron. In the next two weeks, Sterling will react to dollar and every silly announcement by the UK uh, campaign t teams. Can't see retail traders being wise uh, to be in Sterling market on the 23rd of June. Uh, it will bounce. All right, so the guest who's noting this comments... Um, yeah, I don't really know if I can comment on that per se, whether traders are being wise being in the pound into the Brexit or not. You know, retail traders are going to do what retail traders are going to do. Um, I agree with you that the headlines have sort of been polluted with this for way too long. And I think markets are starting not only to be pricing it in, but also getting kind of numb to all these polls. Um, so, look, guys, from a near term prospect, we're not going to mess with it until we get into that release at the end of the day. Scalping sterling dollar, scalping sterling yen on intraday price action yeah, has nothing to do with the Brexit vote. That's still two weeks away or a week away from now, basically uh, 10 days. And, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Uh, in the meantime, price action is what guides our trades, price action is what we study, and price action is what we're going to follow. Very simple. Um, be mindful, though, that you know this guest is absolutely right. Anytime you get some official coming out or a new poll or something, uh, you're going to see a lot of volatility in the pound crosses. Oh, Mir, great question. Uh, and I've been getting this a lot lately. So um, he says, the U.S. dollar is strengthening. At the same time, gold is strengthening. How does this add up? Safe haven and risk off? Great question. Okay, here's what the gold trade looks like, and this is something I've been following also as well. You can see this on the recent gold uh, forecast over on Daily FX. Uh, look, there's a whole different bunch of host of reasons, and if I was on CNBC right now, I could come up with a whole bunch of smart sounding reasons for why the fundamentals point to gold rallying. Uh, but look, at the end of the day, you have um, monetary policy across the globe rushing to the bottom, right? You got negative rates, you got expectations of lower rates from the RBA, expectations of lower rates from the RBNZ, um, and such. You got concerns over slowdown in China. You got concerns over what's happening with the Brexit vote. And then the real thing that sort of triggered this whole bout of gold strength was the weak non-farm payroll figures that we got from the U.S. And certainly that was the weakest numbers that we've gotten this year. Um, they also saw uh, an additional contraction in labor force participation, which is not a good thing. We talked about that at the top of the hour. And some of these concerned is some of these concerns is filtering into, in my opinion, a slight risk off environment. Now is this full risk off? No. Um, I wouldn't say that by any means because you're still looking at equity markets pretty damn close to the highs. You might not be trading you know at the, record all-time highs, but you're still within the weekly opening range. So, by the way, this is the S&P 500, good way to segue into it, uh, setting a very clear monthly opening range. Okay, oh, monthly opening range low, you're heading into it now near 2084. Monthly opening range high came just ahead of the high day close from last year. 
and that's the range break I'm looking for heading deeper into June trade. Note that you're getting some momentum divergence into these highs, price action making higher highs on a closed basis, the oscillator making lower highs, and failure to hold above 60 here does suggest you're at risk for some more near-term weakness. Now. For the S&P, if you do see a downside break, last month, keep in mind, we saw a topside break of the opening range way late in the month on the 25th. We closed right at the highs. So if we do see a downside break here on FOMC or uh, if we do get that trigger to the downside, you're looking at a drop basically into key support, which is at the yearly open at 2057. Okay, that's the 2016 yearly open. So for crude, I'm sorry, or for gold, sorry to segue there, but for gold, um, I don't want to necessarily stress, is it risk on, is it risk off, what's going on, why is it moving in tandem with the dollar. The dollar index is pretty clear on what it's doing. Uh, gold is pretty clear as far as what it's doing, and I'm treating these on their own merits. Bottom line, mirror. I don't want to correlate the two at this time. Um, I can tell you that the break above 1262 that we saw last week did shift near term the focus to the upside. I was looking at resistance at 1277, which is what we posted on that forecast for Friday. Uh, and here's the break. So if we close today above this, you're basically looking for a rally into the, hot, into the um, well, it's 1291, 1293. I know I only have 1293 here, but 1293 is the 2015 high week close. 1291 is the 2016 high day close. Okay, it's the, the, the high that we made on May 2nd. So that's sort of the near-term resistance level that we're coming into right now. Um, and if we clear that, I think you got tons of room to the upside. Tons of room to the upside. Here's what gold, by the way, looks like on the weekly chart. Okay. Again, put a gun to my head right now heading into the week. What would I expect? I would expect to see this thing spike into a high before pulling back again. The 2014 high week close comes in at 1334. I remain constructive on gold, broadly speaking, while above 1240. Mir, does that help as far as a near-term price action? Here's what gold looks like on the 30-minute chart. We've been following this over on SB. Again, there's that near-term bearish invalidation level at 1260, uh, 1277. We close right below on uh, the Friday uh, close right here. Here's the break. Next subsequent topside target, 1291, 1293. Again, 2014 high week close, 2016 high day close, uh, and subsequent targets into 1301, 1303. Um, constructive above 1250. Expect some pullback here. Expect some pullback here. Um, again, some ongoing divergence into the highs that we've been making into the close of the week and start of this week so far. Right? Even if RSI makes equal highs and price action pushes into a new high, excuse me, that's still, in my opinion, um, constructive. Mir says, yes, so stay constructive on gold, right? Longer term, Mir. The immediate risk is, yeah, you can stretch into 1293, 1291. I would expect to see some pullback. But yeah, longer term, I do remain constructive uh, for the gold trade. Sure. Now, I tell you, Mir, the only fundamental thing that could come out and really slam gold is if the Fed really shocks markets. If we look at Fed fund futures heading into the end of the week and we're pricing in like a October cut or a November cut. Uh, if we do see interest rate expectations brought forward dramatically, I think that'll weigh on gold. Remember, gold does not pay a yield. You do have to pay for storage costs, and um, the overall the overall carry cost is heavier or, or, or higher than it is. Um, you know, if interest rates move higher, and I can just put my money in a in a bank account. So certainly, uh, it's going to have an effect here on crude or on <laughs> FOMC. If we do see those interest rate expectations brought forward, look for that sell off. Um, to find some support into that 1250 region. Again, that's still going to be my near-term bullish invalidation. All right. Okay. Um, I am running low on time. I do want to cover Euro real quick. I see pound CAD, and I see some questions on pound yen, guys. I can't go into detail on that. I don't have time. We'll do that tomorrow morning in SB Trade Desk. 
Uh, we typically have a lot more time to go into detail on some of those trades. Here's what Euro dollar looks like. I could be remiss if I didn't go over this heading into the FOMC announcement. Near term resistance we just checked and held. Um, but I do still think you can get a pop higher in Euro. So watch this region. I'm looking at the median line extending off the highs there. Also look at a 50% basic retracement of the advance off the lows. Key resistance we reversed off of like textbook with an outside day reversal here on the 9th just ahead of that 618 retracement. Here's what it looks like on the 30 minute chart. And here's what we look like on SB uh, last week. Okay, so heading into the end of the week ahead of that Friday release, we were looking for a drop towards 1281 and 1255. We got that. There's 1281, there's 1255. We're straddling 1255 right now. That's this region, this region right here around the 50% retracement. So I'm looking for a nice weekly opening range break here. I favor a topside rally uh, that would give us just a pushback towards resistance. Um, key support at this point, I'm looking right here at the 618 into the two the hundred day moving average so 12 10 into 12 17 if you do see a break below that uh, in my mind that would constitute a much larger pullback here for the euro um, you know in such a scenario you're basically looking for a drop into that lower parallel and that could take you as low as like 111.40 111.50 depending on where we are in time so near term the focus is on this region right here as we straddle that 50 percent retracement uh, immediate soft resistance at 1280 Near-term support, 1217 into 1210. All right, and we'll give you updates again on this as we get deeper into the week um, and closer to non-farm payrolls. Any questions on the euro? Jamie, I think I missed this question of yours. I'm not sure what you mean by dollar cost averaging is out, the, out of the question. Um, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I do dollar cost average a lot, but here's the thing that I will do that I guess a lot of retail traders do the opposite of. Uh, I want to cost average into a winner, not a loser. So a lot of times the market will be pulling back. All of a sudden I'm taking a long position here, right? Uh, the market breaks that near-term support. Well, the next level Mike is looking at, at is at 12.17. So if the market drops in 12.17, I'll buy some more. That's not something I'll do. Why? just doesn't make sense to me. Now every every pip lower, you're exponentially losing more, right? I'd rather cost average into a winner. I'd rather see that low hold, top side break, a pullback give me another hold of support, entry on the long again, give me a little bit more of a run, right? Dollar cost averaging into a loser is a really quick way to make a mess of things. Now, this is as it pertains to near term trading. I can't speak of that if you're looking for a more medium term approach. I know if you're someone who's looking for, you know, four, five, six hundred pip move, sure, the market moves back a 30 pip uh, drop into the next support barrier, and you see a long trigger, it might be an opportunity to load up even more. Uh, but from an intraday standpoint, I could just tell you from experience, guys, that's a real quick way to really uh, chop yourself up. So as far as cost averaging in, I'm always going to, you know, favor cost averaging into a winner. Uh, as opposed into a loser. So a little note of uh, a little note there, Jamie. I hope that helps answer your question. All right. So Frank, did you get that chart on the S and P? Uh, I hope that helps. Uh, we covered crude. We covered dollar index. We covered gold. And Aussie 7360 support, Euro dollar watch this straddle at 12.55. All right, that's all my notes for here today. U.S. markets just came online, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up here. We'll see you tomorrow morning again on SB Trade Desk at 8.30 Eastern for another intraday strategy webinar. Hopefully, we'll get a little bit more clarity in some of these dollar crosses as we do see the opening ranges start to pan out. Uh, again, for those of you who are interested in that service, here is that link one more time. Uh, for the daily FX user uh, subscriber discount. I uh, hope that offers uh, some interest, if, or if you're interested rather in that offer, uh, do feel free uh, to click on that link and check us out. All right, guys, have a great week trading. Best of luck trading the FOMC, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, 8.30 Eastern on SB. Cheers.